Hello, everyone. Hey, Eric. All right. Thank you for thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Eric Till, and first, I want to thank you for joining us today for Skydio Doc Talk. So, not long ago, we introduced Skydio Doc and Remote Ops, and we shared how some of our early customers were putting Doc to work in tough places to solve their tough problems. These customers work in industries that are critical to our society and way of life. And today we'll be doing a deep dive into Doc in the utility space, one of those industries, discussing mission progress from the field, the capabilities of Doc, and how it's transforming operations for leading organizations. So we'll be diving first into the industry challenges and today's use cases for Doc and Remote Ops, the future of autonomous missions, and getting started with a doc program in your organization and more. So you're in for some great discussions. Please make sure to ask your questions in the chat throughout the presentation. And we'll be answering questions live through the chat and have time saved at the end to have our panelists answer live. So with that said, I'm excited to introduce two senior leaders at Skydio, VP of Customer Success, Alden Jones, and VP of Software Engineering, Ryan Redding as well as two utilities industry veterans who bring decades of experience to our team, Senior Director of Energy Marketing, Christina Park, and Utility Solutions Specialist, Corey Hitchcock. Christina, let's start with you. Can you please share a bit about your background and then hand the mic over to Corey and team before we jump in? Sure, thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone, I'm Christina Park, and I recently joined Skydio from the utility sphere after the last 15 years at the New York Power Authority. As Senior Director of Asset Intelligence Solutions, I led the effort to operationalize technology across the enterprise by standing up the RCM, or Reliability Center Maintenance Program, and identifying gaps for technical enablement to bring solutions to scale. So my department tested and integrated robotics, mm -hmm. sensors, and data analytics to connect problems to solutions. Here at Skydio, I'm the Senior Director of Energy Marketing, and I'm excited to connect the problems that exist out in the field to the solutions like Doc that Skydio has to offer. Corey? Thanks, Christina. Hey, I'm Corey Hitchcock. I'm new to Skydio. Uh, I'm a utility solution specialist, and I've got a 23-year background in the utility industry where I was a transmission and distribution lineman. Um, I also operated the distribution system. And since 2015, uh, I've worked to develop the Southern Company UAS program across five operating companies, uh, initially under the Chapter 333 exemption and then on into the Part 107 environment that we operate in today. Alden? Sweet. Thanks, Corey. Good morning, everybody. I'm Alden. Um, I started my career about 15 years ago as an Army officer. Um, I guess you could say I really kind of cut my teeth in operational leadership there, both here in the States and deployed overseas. Um, after the Army, I held some leadership roles at United Technologies and Frito-Lay. Uh, but I'm a nerd at heart, and I wanted to get into tech, so I found myself at a company called American Tower, working on some software there. Um, and eventually found my way into founding their drone program. Um, our goal was to digitize a portfolio of about 40,000 assets. Uh, we started back in 2016 in the early days of, you know, phantoms and drone phot photogrammetry, which some folks on the call maybe remember, uh, but eventually scaled that out into full scale operationalization and automation, full workforce retraining, back end system integrations, all the kind of fun stuff that we'll probably be talking about today. So hopefully that resonates with folks and really excited to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'll pass it off to Ryan. Great, thanks Alden. Um, as uh, indicated here, I lead our software engineering teams and I'm also responsible for product development on the Docket Boat Ops program. I've been building systems uh, for about 20 years now. In the first half of my career, I spent uh, working in the national security space, so building highly secure uh, communication systems um, and also security applications for various uh, kind of high consequential environments. I moved into private industry uh, and worked at uh, lead teams at uh, Cisco Mer Meraki, if you're familiar with their cloud connected IT equipment, and then most recently at Samsara. Um, Samsara uh, was a uh, company focused on kind of IoT applications, combined hardware software systems that are connecting the physical world um, to the digital uh, world and really optimizing physical operations. And that experience translated really well for me coming into Skydio where I got really excited about the future of what we could do with connected fleets of drones. Um, I've been at Skydio for about two and a half years now working on that vision. Um, and that's really manifested itself into where we are with Skydio Doc and Remote Ops. So with that, um, I'll get us into our conversation today. And as Eric mentioned, uh, we started last uh, year with Doc Day, 
Um, back in December, we unveiled Skydio Doc in Remote Ops and shared some of its applications, um, our vision for the product, some of the things we were working on, as well as some of our challenges. Um, we believe very strongly that partnership with customers is how we're going to be successful here. So we've been working closely with our customers um, and partners to, to build out capabilities and, and solve problems um, since then. And we've seen a ton of engagement in the utility industry. Um, so we want to focus on the conversation today um, on that, given kind of the, the interest that we've been seeing. Um, talk about uh, the potential that Doc represents there, some of the progress that we're making. We're very fortunate to have Corey and Christina um, on the team with their expertise to both have this conversation, but also guide us on a daily basis on our product development. I think it would make a lot of sense for us to just talk a little bit about kind of the problems from, from your experience that you see um, in the space and like set that foundation for kind of talking about technical solutions um, for them going forward. So Christine, maybe I can turn it over to you to give a little perspective um, on, on the challenges that you see in the industry. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So the biggest challenge that I saw uh, in my role to asset management and maintenance is the balance between the needs of aging infrastructure against the availability of the workforce. And really, how do you prioritize all of the work that needs to be done? So in the face of aging infrastructure, the risk of failure is high and there are tough decisions to be made in, in order to prioritize which assets get attention over others. So intelligent robotics and uh, sensors such as Skydio solutions are an excellent risk mitigation tool. So this enables the user to get a more accurate assessment of the assets at risk and thus better inform the priorities and decisions to repair, replace or run to failure. So the goal is really to do the right work at the right time and it can often feel like throwing darts or threading a needle to get it just right. Um, and that's really just for plan maintenance. So if we factor in unplanned or emergent work, that really throws a wrench into everyone's budget and schedules. Um, and those are often set a year in advance. Additionally, retirements in a changing workforce pose a risk to losing subject matter expertise, which is often built over the course of an entire career. So in, at the end of the day, I think superintendents and directors are often faced with more work than their workforce can handle. Corey, can I kick it over to you to give your perspective? Sure, yeah. I'd say even with the great strides uh, made in the last 10 years with distribution automation and fault location analysis, there still has to be a human in the loop before those final customers can be restored. Um, I think the dock-based drone operations allow for uh, more timely situational awareness on the status of the system so, so that you and or the operator could make uh, switching decisions. Do we do we switch to restore as many customers as we can, uh, or is the line and, or equipment safe to re-energize because that outage was was momentary, like a like a tree falling through the line, or you know not causing any damage with uh, wire down or broken poles? Um, maybe just a follow up question for each of you. I'm actually going to start with you, Corey. Uh, so just Christina was mentioning, you know, that workforce prioritization is really important. I'm curious, just as a layperson not coming from the utility industry, I'm assuming that people have different skill sets and not everyone is just transposable to different jobs. You've been working, you know, in, I guess you would say dangerous and really important roles at, throughout your career. Like, how does the team think about dispatching people based on their skill sets, especially with the, the workforce that we have today? Uh, you know, over at Southern, we we found the right person for the right job, uh, you know, a, a uh, and we also put drones in those people's hands uh, so they could use them as a tool in their toolbox. Like we wanted the SME to make to be on site, to be able to make that decision and be able to, um, you know, uh, very quickly and rapidly, you know, make an assessment of what was going on out there and be able to. Um, you know, communicate the traditional method, whether that's a radio or telephone, you know, like, hey, we need, we've got a broken pole out here, we're going to need X equipment to, uh, you know, to repair it. So that, that's how we did it. So I feel like that dovetails into my question for you, Christina, you mentioned that, you know, there's a there's a changing workforce, and there's challenges right now with utilities losing subject matter expertise. I'm curious, you know, as a leader, how you were dealing with that, but also maybe more importantly, since we're, we're here in a sky talk, you know, how do you see technology playing a role in that? Yeah, I think that uh, my experience at NIPA was that we had some really, really talented staff. Uh, I think even when I joined, I, I was working for uh, probably one of the lead uh, hydro engineers and hydro gurus uh, known in, in the sphere across the nation. But eventually everybody retires. Uh, occasionally we have deaths. Uh, we had somebody who 
had a heart attack one day. And when we opened up the machines to look at what was in there, we realized they don't look like they do in the drawings because this guy kept the plant running. He, he didn't necessarily document everything. He just quietly went in when there was a problem, fixed the problem and everything kept running until he was no longer there to pass that knowledge on. So one thing that I quickly realized uh, from when I was a, more of a junior engineer and into a management role is that intellectual capital is really important to capture. And historically, utilities have relied on the expertise of staff who've really stayed for their whole careers. And they have all the knowledge and experience to diagnose what they see almost instantly, right? And that's really just been passed down from, you know, person, uh, you know, expert to apprentice and, and passed down that way. But the reality is that retirements of subject matter experts are uh, even more prevalent, I think, since COVID. Um, there are challenges of succession planning and there's a cultural shift happening now as far as the length of tenure goes, right? So um, it's becoming more and more rare that somebody stays at one job for their entire career um, and holds that knowledge and keeps it in house. So with all these things in mind, I think it becomes even more important to embed the knowledge, uh, all that experience, and to really figure out how to roadmap uh, decision-making in process and records via technology. So putting tools in the hands of the workers, like Corey said, it not only accelerates and expands the scope of what they can do in the same amount of time, but recording and making that data accessible facilitates getting more of that knowledge and experience out of an expert's head and into an organizational database. So Christina, maybe to follow up on that, specifically as it relates to moving from, you know, maybe manually piloted drone operations to dock operations, it seems like an obvious thing is being able to like collect more data and retain more intelligence in the systems, you know, capture more data and retain more intelligence in the systems records as opposed to relying on maybe a more transient workforce. Um, you know, how, how do you see that? Is, is that, you know, how you see this and how do you see the kind of the role of, of, of dock drones playing um, into being able to capture that intelligence for your organization? Yeah, I think, um, you know, every manager, uh, no matter where you sit in middle management all the way up, you're just really faced with budget constraints, with um, open positions that may or may not be easy to fill. And I think some of it is just having that all in one place makes it easy to transfer that knowledge uh, from somebody who's been there a long time to somebody who's just coming in, right? There's something for them to study. There's more data that's available to them. Um, I think it also takes a lot of the pressure off. Um, I think having been one myself, there's a lot of pressure if you're considered the subject matter expert. And if there's a leak or there's a, an explosion or there's a fire and somebody's coming to you and it's on your shoulders to make a decision in, in an instant, that's a lot of pressure. And I think that um, having data and having records and having uh, the ability to make more data-driven de decisions, I, I think it, it makes it easier even just psychologically for, for people to be level-headed uh, and to do their jobs. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, and Corey, you were talking about like drones as tools for folks. Um, just real, real quickly, could you give a little more detail on like, you know, how you see drones being used by folks um, today to have an impact um, on, you know, utility operations? Sure. So, so since 2015, I've seen and developed drone use cases that touch almost every aspect of the utility business. And when people think utility business, uh, they don't, they, they think, power lines and substations. They don't necessarily think about shoreline management, uh, concrete condition inspections and, and operating, you know, over a nuclear reactor with a drone to do dry well inspections. Um, you know, drones have been proven to provide those cost savings and reduce that hazardous duty exposure to humans. Um, the state of the UAS tech today, though, uh, and the current regulatory environment still require that that humans be on site and, uh, you know, keep the drone within line of sight when those operations occur. I think. Cool. Um, go well, on, I guess, I, I mean, one of the things maybe to point out or, or, or just to chat about is, you know, we've, Corey, you and I have been doing this, but different different types of organizations for a little while. We've, we've all played in the regulatory environment, but I think recently we've seen, especially with Scadio technology and obstacle avoidance and some of the um, close proximity, low altitude waivers that we're getting, like real traction with the regulators in terms of operations. And I guess just kind of tacking onto your point here about the regulatory environment, I'm wondering if you might be able to comment like in so much that Scadio has been able to get some real success with regulators and BV loss waiver is like how much of the types of missions that you were doing when you were doing crude operations, do you think you could cover with the types of close proximity, low altitude missions that we're getting waivers for today? 
Um, I don't I don't know if I have a good percentage of that, but but the types of operations, I guess, um, you know, anything in a fixed, um, you know, limited access facility, uh, rural remote, which is like 90 percent of uh, of operations across most utility space because everything's not in the you know, in a city. Um, you know, that stuff can be done with a dock and, and can be done today. And and with those close proximity, low altitude uh, waivers that you described or talked about, um, you know, that that's a reality today. Um, and, and we've got customers out there operating these drones in this manner. Great, thanks. Um, so following up from Alden's question here, um, obviously, you know, we're talking about Skydio Dock. We see some imagery here of flying in the substation. Like how, and, you know, kind of generally speaking, and Christina, maybe we can hear from you first. Like how do you see um, Dock kind of changing operations um, for utilities? Yeah, I think from an asset management perspective, Dock is really the next step in the journey from time-based maintenance to condition-based maintenance. Um, so many utilities have deployed sensors uh, to some degree to increase the frequency of monitoring, right? So, but often, oftentimes that's not possible or it's extremely arduous depending on the asset, depending on the location um, and the volatility. So drones with cameras and subsequently using data analytics, it's a way of creating a mobile sensor um, and Doc enables the user to easily get information from remote locations such as transmission paths and right of ways uh, or potentially dangerous ones like substations. Yeah, and, and I think of Doc kind of like having a lineman or substation electrician or power plant system owner that's on, on duty and on site like 24 hours a day. Um, don't need to feed them, don't need to water them. Um, when an event happens or, or switching is planned or a shoreline needs to be inspected, that dock-based uh, fully remote and autonomous solution allows for that. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And you know, we've heard from folks, you know, substations are super complex and they're highly consequential. Uh, and you know, the things that you need to do to get the intelligence um, in those environments, you know, you need to be able to fly in these relatively um, complex environments with with high confidence. Uh, and we've heard from customers that Skydio drones, you know, with the autonomy that we have and obstacle avoidance are really the only drones that they feel comfortable like flying with, with confidence in these environments and be able to capture the kind of data that they need. Um, you know, how, how do you see Skydio systems kind of being uniquely qualified to have impact in a substation, especially when we're trying to capture, you know, information like we see on screen here? Yeah, so, so with substation operations, uh, routine inspection and event-based inspection can be done with that uh, dock-based solution. Um, routine inspections like your, your oil level readings, your counter readings, and other manual visual inspection tasks can be performed by that dock-based drone at a higher frequency um, and providing near real-time situational awareness without having to roll that truck. Um, and then when we when we talk about those, like for instance, the counter readings that we've got to get, that that's uh, imagine uh, an old school uh, car odometer, not digital, but with the rot rotor dials. Um, that's the the size of the counter that's on these breaker controls, and and that's something that the drone needs to see. Um, and and with event based inspections, the dock based drone could inspect automated switches that will be operated. So like a, a transmission breaker that has SF6 gas inside, um, you could uh, verify that quantity of gas before you operated that switch. And then um, post switching operation, you could uh, ensure that you had nominal switch engagement by conducting that quick um, automated thermal scan of the switch under load. Corey, maybe just to follow up there. I mean, I, I'm, I don't know, but I'd like to ask, I'm, uh, are a lot of, uh, you know, preventative inspections or routine inspections regulated or driven by company SOPs or a combination of both? Um, it depends on, on the, the, the states, like regulators, basically. There are, like in transmission side, there's federal regulations that govern uh, or require all utilities to have a, an inspection pro program. It doesn't necessarily say what that program needs to be. But, um, but yeah, I'd say it's a, a combination of federal and state regulation that, uh, that ensures that the power system remains reliable. So, I mean, obviously, as Skydio and with our dock solution, those are things that we'd want to be able to free up uh, utility labor to not have to go do and, and have availability to go do other things that are maybe higher value by, by replicating and automating those, those um, 
routine inspections. I'm curious though, you mentioned about truck rolls and this is something in my prior life that I was certainly concerned with from a cost perspective, like event-based inspections and rolling a truck, I'm, I'm assuming is expensive, but you know, how, how expensive is it? Is that, is that something that, that folks are challenged with on a regular basis when they're trying to manage their operational budgets? Yeah, yeah. In a, in a past life, I heard a number that was uh, around $5,500 to roll a, uh, a crew and a truck like out to go look at something. Um, and, you know, having that dock based solution just living in the station and you, you, you can get it when you need it prevents that. So, yeah, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And, you know, the other thing that we've been seeing, so we've been working with folks to actually plan um, you know, pre-planned missions to go and get eyes on some of the critical assets, the gauges um, in substation. And um, for, for those that, you know, might remember Doc Day, we announced, um, you know, uh, our capability of using visual positioning to have highly accurate flights. And we've actually found that to be very important for substation navigation, because as I was mentioned too, they're like highly complex. We need to get back into like very specific locations and actually get pretty close to the assets to be able to get you the oil or the gauge readings that you need. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious your perspective on kind of the importance of like being able to get back tight into, um, you know, infrastructure to get the value, you know, out of running those missions, either autonomously or manually. And, um, you know, how you look at Skydio systems as being uniquely qualified to be able to do that, um, in those environments. Yeah. So, so the vision positioning system allows the, um, the drone to, to move in areas that, uh, you probably like, I wouldn't personally fly a manual drone in some of the locations that we're able to put, um, Skydio equipment, um, the ability to get, to get close to things. Um, like I mentioned before about that counter reading, that's something that, uh, that in a routine substation inspection, that's something that they take a note of and, uh, and being able to see that, um, you know, through the glass uh, at, you know, the, the small font that it is um, requires the drone to get close and, and that collision avoidance capability um, allows that to happen. Um, uh, for, for instance, yeah. we had a customer that, um, that was planning, we were, we were commissioning the dock to basically um, uh, plan different flight plans for individual switches and different components inside the station that they wanted to inspect. And um, and one of our customers on a commissioning flight for a um, um, non load break transmission switch, it was at 345 kV, um, was able to identify some uh, um, improper, improperly adjusted switch parts and be able to uh, change out those parts and not have to swap out a two hundred fifty thousand dollar switch. Um, in addition to the fact that it was feeding a critical customer um, and they were able to to switch that part out or switch out the, the component and change out the part and then re-energize the component without having an interruption to that customer. So that that was pretty it was a pretty big deal. Um, and overall, that uh, that switch was uh, around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars if they had to swap it out. So being able to identify those parts and swap that out saved a bunch of money. Um, maybe a follow up to that. So like Corey mentioned, we've been deploying a lot with customers and substations where we see a lot of value and, and where our product has some unique capabilities. Uh, Christina, question for you, um, especially with your background. I know you have a lot of hydro background and, and in your previous life have, have dealt with all types of different um, utility use cases. Like what are some other event based use cases that you can think of or that you would have wanted to deploy doc with, you know, if you were still with NIPA? Yeah, I think uh, beyond the transmission sphere and, and with substations, I think there are a ton of hydro applications. So if you think about dams, dams are really like the number one most critical asset to any hydro plant. Um, and not only are they critical and they're expensive, but they're also heavily regulated. So in order to meet uh, the FERC regulations and to really have an accurate picture of, of what's happening with our asset and any early indicators that there might be a problem, I think there's tremendous value to that. I think also if you have any sort of waterways, uh, when you have embankments, you have reservoirs, being able to uh, monitor even slowly, right, over time to be able to see how reservoirs might be changing shape or how embankments and erosion uh, is happening, uh, that, that will help you make decisions and to plan well into the future uh, for where your budget goes and, and where you're allocating your manpower. So 
the way it's done today, I think helicopters are costly to operate and there are crashes and even deaths that have happened. Um, boats on waterways, they're just really, really slow and they're expensive. Um, if you factor in weather, summer is hot, winter is cold, uh, people don't really want to be out there uh, walking down a dam uh, and, and going down a really long way by, by foot. So from a management point of view, optimizing the reliability and maintenance is just not easy. And the more information that you can get without having to put a person at risk is, is really, really valuable. You mentioned that you know a lot of these assets are, are regulated. I just as a lay person not coming from the industry, what are some types of um, events that would trigger, I guess, an event-based inspection? Sure. I mean, if we just think simply of weather events, right? I think in the last few years, we've seen everything under the sun. We've seen fires, we've seen hurricanes, we've seen flooding, um, there are earthquakes. So I think if you only consider natural disasters, uh, those are incidents that uh, provoke, and I believe, an incident command center, right? So we have people who uh, immediately, when there is a flood or there's a hurricane, uh, we have to make sure that, that our dams are holding the water back and in, in the instances where there are flooding, what's going to happen to the towns next to them. And at the end of the day, deploying somebody in a truck uh, in, in rain and wind, uh, that could be really dangerous in, in a flooding situation. Whereas if you could deploy a drone, particularly one that's already stationed out there, you can get information much, much faster uh, and in a much safer way. Can you imagine like, I'm just thinking about the optimal use case, you know, so, Hey, there was a flood or a hurricane or a, maybe even just a giant rainstorm came in. Like we've been having them in California this winter. What does that look like? You know, just is that, Hey, the second it's we're ready, the, the team is deploying drones before they would even consider getting a person out there. Cause it gives them earlier vision into what's happening. Like, can you describe maybe what you would want to do you know, if you were still leading the program there? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, at NIPO, we had this integrated smart operations center. So we have a room that's got a whole bunch of screens. And if we could just bring up uh, eyes on what's happening at any given location, and a lot of power plants are at remote locations, they're not necessarily easy to get to. Um, I think, number one, it's a safety factor. If you can send a drone out there, particularly in weather conditions where it's unknown, um, what's going to happen is, it, is your car going to be able to drive through and then get stuck because... There, there are huge puddles on the road that you can't get through coming back. Um, I think it would give us uh, a much faster awareness uh, of the situation, but then also enable us to make decisions. Do we send somebody out there? Do we see a problem? How many people do we need? I think those are things that you kind of just shoot darts at when there's an actual event and you don't have any sort of digital awareness. But I think having the drones enables us to have eyes in places where, um, where we don't on a daily basis. So maybe last thing, and I'll stop you know, going down this path, but just uh, at the end of the day, you know, we all have finite resources. And so I think a lot of times customers are asking us about ROI when they're thinking about buying and deploying these solutions. I guess in the few examples that we just talked about here, you know, how would you think about and, and try and tell folks who are listening here about the types of ROI that, that you think they could achieve in leveraging these solutions? Yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like it's it's twofold, right? You think about the planned inspections that you have and how you plan them, right? If I think about transmission corridors, that, that's a really long way to go, to send people out, to send people climbing up poles, um, to take pictures, to look at things, to send a helicopter out and, and analyze that the way that it's done today. Um, I think that the ROI is really to say, number one, uh, it's a safety concern, right? So I can send a drone and I can fly it up there instead of having somebody physically climb up a pole and possibly be a fall risk, right? I can send them out into a hilly right of way and have a drone get all the footage that I need instead of having them to climb up and down, up and down on their on their feet, right? With equipment in their on their backs. Um, and then on top of that, I think it's just uh, cost and being able to hone in on exactly where you need to look as opposed to looking at everything. Because there's no way to look at everything all the time. So the way inspections are done, you typically have some sort of maintenance plan. Um, it's determined by the OEM. It's determined by your subject matter experts. And you decide, oh, I'm going to go monthly. I'm going to go quarterly. I'm going to go annually and look at this component because that's about when there might be an indicator that's going to fail. So uh, if you can get more data points and you have a more accurate picture of your asset health, then you can make better decisions on where to prioritize sending your limited workforce um, and hopefully catch problems when they're small before they become big. That's really interesting. I'm just going to restate that because it sounds, it's like fascinating to me. So, and this is true with probably all kinds of different businesses. We only have so many people and resources. So we make decisions 
on when we can send people based on the lowest risk uh, like plan that we have. But at the end of the day, if we wanted to, and we could just have constant visibility of all kinds of stuff, we would definitely use that data. And we wouldn't have to worry about whether or not we're sending a person because the, the asset's just there, the doc is there, and it's just getting inspected and we, we can look at it as much as we want to. Um, I, I'm going to switch subjects here and I'll, I'll stop uh, picking on you, Christina. So maybe Corey for you, like uh, we've heard a, a quite a bit in the news just about substation security. There's been stuff going on with um, you know, domestic terrorism, essentially people deciding to target these assets. I'm curious if maybe you can share a little bit of how you think doc plays into security, both at substations and, and maybe some other places. Yeah, so so I think the um, you know the most important thing when you're responding to a a security incident is is understanding that developing situation, and um, you know the attack by a bad actor that that requires somebody to go out there and figure out what's going on. Um, with with the physical security sensors that are already installed at substations the dock-based drone could be dispatched to that location provided by those sensors to gain that additional situational awareness and not send a human out there. Um, in addition to that security event-based dispatch of the drone, the drone could also provide routine but random security patrols mm -hmm. so as to not provide um, pattern-based intelligence to a bad actor um, and those patrols could be used, for instance, like in the protect in the uh, perimeter of a nuclear protected area um, to provide a map that could be used for change detection to make sure that perimeter is the way it was the last time that it was inspected. Um, that random scheduling of those security patrols, um, I think, also provides a level of deterrence um, as, you know, bad actors likely to move to another target, kind of like a ring doorbell, um, you know, solution. Um, in addition to that, that drone at a nuclear facility, for instance, being used for those security patrols, um, you could also use it for, for some mandated patrols of, uh, of your dry cask storage area um, and be able to you know, have that dock out there and, and be used for multiple different use cases across the, uh, the plant facility and uh, customer owned property. Corey, are there maybe other examples? Uh, I'm just curious, like, you know, a sensor triggering at a substation, initiating an automated perimeter sweep makes sense. I think both you and I in our army backgrounds, we, know, we also know that we don't want to create a pattern that makes sense. Are there other assets that utilities own that have sensors that could trigger a potential security, um, I will say sweep that was, that was dock based that you can think of? I mean, sure. Any any type of uh, of asset the company has that that has physical security protection installed um, could be used. You know, whether it's indoors, outdoors. Uh, you know, we could use that dock based solution to do do those types of uh, of patrols across pretty much any any type of uh, of um, asset the company has. Sweet. Great. Um, we've been peppering you all with questions and this has been awesome, but I you know, also want to uh, give you guys a chance to talk about uh, some of the things from, from your prior, prior lives uh, that you're interested in about the product. Um, so maybe we can kind of switch gears a little bit um, and, uh, and dig into that. Uh, Corey, you want to, you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah. So um, one of the things I think that that's really cool about the uh, about the dock based solution is uh, is the ability for the um, you know the the aircraft to really replace people um, at Southern Company. One of the um, we had a, an accident in 2013. It was a fatality helicopter accident, and that kind of drove us into the drone space and finding a better way to do it. So um, you know, I, I think that's probably the number one. Um, thing that got me excited about drones uh, in addition to the fact that i don't have to climb a tower to see something going on at the top of it or um you know and, and can use thermal like we see there in that video to uh to identify um failing components i thought that was pretty cool great um i i wanted to um you know you talked about event uh based inspections, Corey. Um, and I wanted to like 
get a little bit from you on, you know, maybe more specific examples. And then I want to talk a little bit about how docs and how we envision kind of docs being able to, to, to address that problem from a technical standpoint. Um, can maybe you give know, just a little bit of a more example of like what kind of, you know, Christina talked about some events, but from your perspective, kind of what are some events um, and that, that, you know, use cases that you would like to see around that? Yeah, so, so the um, event-based uh, patrol or event-based inspection that I kind of describe um, in the distribution automation uh, world, um, the, the power companies and utilities are very good at isolating and locating the fault, isolating the fault, and then re-energizing those customers um, that they can. Um, once that fault's isolated, you still have customers that are going to be out and without power. And so the ability to understand what's going on out in the field typically requires a truck to roll out there and then patrol that section of line that's out. Um, having the, the dock-based drone to be able to uh, patrol that section of line um, in an automated fashion in a um, automated dispatched role um, is, is, would be super valuable. That would be game-changing. Um, and it would, it would go... Um, you know, it, I, I feel it would do a great deal to affect the duration of outages. While while that um, that frequency can be affected, the frequency of the outage could be in fact affected by the you know repeated or increased cadence of inspections and identifying problems, small problems before they become big ones. The duration of the outage can be directly affected by the ability of that drone to get out there. Um, patrol that section of line that's out and then um, either re-energize it because it was a momentary outage or, um, or, or get the right personnel and equipment out there to, uh, to affect that repair. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is, you know, from my perspective, one of the most kind of exciting and interesting use cases we, we have for docs. And one of the big reasons that we've been investing heavily in APIs for the system is to enable a wide variety of integrations with data coming in that could trigger interesting, um, you know, missions, inspections, and patrols um, from docs. Uh, so, you know, for example, and I think about this kind of broadly as alert dispatch, we see this across a bunch of different use cases, but, you know, something, you know, a sensor or other, um, you know, uh, input from, from external to the system is, is indicating that there's something of interest happening, right? In this case, it may be, you know, there's maybe something happening on the line or in the substation, something is tripped. Um, and we can feed those alerts through our APIs um, into our systems. Um, and we can do things like dynamic mission creation to then, you know, identify the path to fly um, autonomously to that. We have APIs to trigger um, those missions to run on demand um, so that we don't even have to wait for a human um, to, to initiate um, this. Of course, all these things are available through our cloud um, you know, interface um, as well. And we'll be continuing to build those out based on feedback and this, these interesting use cases to support them. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, that's one of the key thing that's driving um, our API strategy today is, is um, enabling uh, these use cases. When we, when we think about the APIs and the ability for us to leverage automations for a whole bunch of different use cases, and then or, or at the front end of that funnel, triggering or, you know, triggering use cases, and then on the back end of the funnel, moving that data a whole bunch of places. At the end of the day, you know, our goal here is to help our customers drive core metrics that that they care about. And Corey, I'm I'm wondering, you know, I think when you and Christina came on board, you've been helping the broad SCADI organization really understand some of the core metrics like Katie and Sadie that that utilities care about. I'm wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit about that and and dive into for the audience just how you see doc in sort of the examples we've been talking about more generically specifically addressing those core metrics that are important to, to the customers yeah so so um a utility customer that's happy is one that has power um and and when the power goes out that that customer is immediately not happy and the longer that power stays out um the more unhappy that customer gets and so um Sadie and Safi, which is the system average interruption duration index and the system average interruption frequency index, um, both of those um, are, are, are indicators of the health of your power system, 
but more importantly, they're indicators of the happiness of your customers because the shorter the duration of the outage, the happier your customers are. And the, the, the decrease in frequency of outage, the happier your customers are. And um, like I said earlier, the, um, the increasing the frequency of inspections allows you to identify problems before they become big ones, like that, uh, that customer we talked about with the, uh, the substation switch, right? They were able to identify that problem, fix it, and then not interrupt their very important customer they had out there, the transmission customer that they had. But, um, but that directly plays to the frequency of the outage, because if you can identify the problem, you can potentially um, repair that problem without uh, interrupting the customer's power. You can switch it out. You can reroute power. You can do different things. And then um, the duration is directly affected, I think, by having those automated controls, whether it's substation or line um, in a in the substation environment, um, you know, there's wildlife that likes to, uh, to interrupt people's power. And, um, and the, the, you know, identifying that it was a, a wildlife that caused the outage and that that wildlife is no longer a, a problem to the outage and that the equipment is still, um, you know, in good shape allows you to um, re-energize that station or, or that equipment um, faster and, uh, and decreases that duration of the outages. You know, some of these areas that, that um, you know, it may take three hours for some, somebody to drive, you know, from one end of their territory to the other to get to that substation so that they can see it. And nothing can be done really except for switching in the field can be done until, you know, you get eyes on it. Hey, thanks, Corey. So, you know, I think from where I sat in asset management and strategic ops at NIPA, I was really squarely in middle management where I had to engage stakeholders kind of both up and down the chain. So um, I think it's one thing to find a really cool piece of technology, but it's a whole different ballgame to get it to work within the ecosystem of the utilities database, right? Um, and successfully do the change management necessary to get everyone to truly adopt it. So um, I think since joining Skydio, one thing I realized was that I originally thought that Skydio was a hardware solution uh, company. And I actually came to realize that th these are actually software solutions on plumbing hardware. So Ryan, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the focus in software engineering that enables these drugs? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think. Um, one of the things I guess, like maybe just taking a step back, that I think is important, and you know, you picked up on this, is like the the the, the view of the of the product that we provide is really a software system that is um, that that is changing over time um, that we're investing in, and that's very much how we look at this. And I, I contrast that to like a hardware product. You know, if you think about buying a TV from you know Best Buy or wherever people buy TVs today, and you know, you get it off the shelf, it is what it is, and then after some time, you go and get the next one. Um, as we think about kind of end-to-end -end solutions in, you know, the utility space and other industries, um, kind of the focus really becomes on like, what are the software capabilities that en enable those, you know, insights to be gathered, enable those workflows uh, in the business to be optimized and as efficient as possible. Uh, and I know this is like a bit of a high level question, but I think it's super critical in how we approach solving these problems. We don't, we don't approach them by being a building a piece of technology and putting it on the shelf, but we we build it through partnerships. We build it through having software products that can really uh, improve rapidly over time based on these like close relationships and feedback. Um, and I think for in terms of like getting programs, if you think about the crawl, walk, run, especially for the utility space, this is going to be something that, you know, technology adoption is going to happen over the course of years and maybe decades. Um, and being in a place where you can really, you know, build those relationships, uh, have, have a partner like Skydio that can help you um, operationalize your programs is super important. Uh, I know this is something that all of them thinks about all the time, right? Like how do we get, um, you know, from where we are today to the visions of the things that we're talking about, realizing the, the ROI and the benefits. And, you know, we have some things we can do today, but certainly there's much more potential that we have in the future. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I think one other question I had is, you know, once the organization is ready and committed to remote ops, let's say, um, it can be pretty intimidating to stare down the barrel of the regulatory requirements. So I know when I opened the FAA site and looked at the application, it was just a bunch of boxes and a bunch of legalese that I just couldn't understand. So um, can one of you speak to how Skydio can help navigate that process? Uh, yeah, I can take that. So maybe just to start off and just to be really clear, um, one of the things that makes Skydy unique in the regulatory world is our autonomy and obstacle avoidance. Some of the stuff that Corey was talking about with our lack of reliance of, on a magnetometer. What that really means in layman terms 
is that we can go places that other people can't. We're not going to crash. And due to the autonomous nature of the system and the, its true vision-based autonomy, not just planned waypoint missions that could be input incorrectly, um, the FAA and our regulatory team have really gotten to a place where there is mutual trust in the system to act and do things correctly in the uh, event of an anomaly. And so really what that means is we've built um, a regulatory as a service team and partnership is really key here. Whenever we're working with customers, we really stress, unless they have a, a fully robust regulatory team with drone experience, but we really stress that they work with our world-class regulatory team um, to go build out the types of waivers that they're going to need. Because at the end of the day, the vision of DOC is one that is beyond visual line of sight. It's not standing next to it. And we have proven success now with multiple customers, not only getting waivers for all different kinds of assets, you know, transmission, substation, generation, any of these things, but also now based on the technology portfolio that we have and our ability to do what I mentioned before, close proximity, low altitude, essentially what we call infrastructure masking, where the assets itself protect the drone from the airspace and vice versa. So the overall risk to the airspace is very low and, and the FAA feels comfortable with that and the demonstrated success that we've had. We've now been able to take those wins and turn them into broader waivers that are impacting multiple sites at a time, dozens of sites. So, hey, it's not what you would call a, a national blanket waiver, but for all the customers that we're working with, um, they're seeing great success in being able to, you know, take down a dozen substations at once. And we kind of work together in a partnership to slowly work through their highest priority assets, the things where we want to deploy the dock to first, do that in a true BV loss way, and then work together through that crawl, walk, run phase to get to the end state where we all want to get to, where a lot of what you, Christina, and, and Corey have been talking about, where docks are eliminating the need for humans to roll trucks first. And we're just getting the information right away and then being really uh, judicious and efficient with the resources that the, the customers are deploying. So I think this is a great uh, point to kind of transition to Q&A. And there's actually um, some questions um, from the, the uh, audience here that are very relevant to what you were just talking about, Alden. Um, so maybe I'll read some questions here. Uh, and related to regulatory and FAA, uh, the first question is, you know, what documentation is available from Skydio so we can submit to FAA a letter of petition for exemption. What would you know? What would you say to folks, you know, asking kind of this question and how to engage with Skydio? What Skydio resources are available? Yeah. So the first thing is working with your account executive, the Skydio account executive. We have multiple levels of regulatory service engagements, um, from sort of the basic documentation and helping you populate the form if you want to do those things to yourselves, all the way to full. Um, we'll call it white glove service, but in, in addition to that, really pushing the boundary into new types of waivers. So the short answer to this question is to work with both your account executive, your solutions engineer, and then our world-class regulatory team. And, and then we can scale those services based on your level of expertise or your desire to do the work versus us. Great. And uh, you know, related to another thing you were talking about, and uh, this one will be for, for Corey, um, how do you compare the, the the TOC of a truck roll OPEX versus kind of the expense of the dock drone CapEx, you know, kind of basically the trade-off between, you know, the, those two, those two costs. Uh, Corey, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, you know, decreasing the frequency of outages and decreasing that duration, um, you know, provides that value. I mean, when you start talking about customer minutes interrupted and the revenue that's that's attached with with a customer minute interrupted, um, and then add that to a breaker that's out that may have 5,500 customers every minute that multiplies by 5,500 and that's lost revenue. Um, I think that uh, that the um, the drone in the box or the, the dock solution, I think, is. Um, I think I think it makes as much sense as, as installing distribution automation equipment, you know, on your on your system. I, I think it just uh, it, it'll wind up paying for itself with those customer minutes not interrupted. I, I also might add something to that, which is, you know, uh, we deal with this across a wide span of customers, whether it's utility or, you know, government or anything. Um, different customers are trying, depending on where their program sits, what they're trying to achieve. They're trying to manage different budgets and be more efficient, whether that's on the OPEX side or the CAPEX side. 
And the Skydio sales team and the solutions engineering team, part of the cycle is to work really closely with you to build an ROI platform or, or program so that you can take that back to your organization and tailor how you want to go and invest in these things based on the types of budgets that you have available and the types of savings that you're trying to achieve. And that's all part of the direct sales motion and the, and the really high quality Skydio team um, on the sales and solutions engineering uh, teams to, to go work on that with you. That's great. Um, I guess moving to the next question, uh, there's a good question here uh, on integrations. Is there a possibility of integrating a weather system app um, to the dock? So I can um, answer this. Uh, this is actually something that we're actively um, working on now and speaks to like kind of a broader, um, you know, uh, capability uh, development that we're moving or we're making kind of in the support of the regulatory space. So this includes, you know, not just weather, um, but also, you know, uh, how do we ensure safe operations around um, safe distances from, uh, from the dock? Um, how do we think about things like detecting void and shielded operations? And these are all things that come up when you, you know, look at, uh, you know, waiver um, applications for a particular um, system. So we work very closely with the regulatory team to ensure that our product is going to be supporting the latest and greatest waivers that are going to be available to customers, making sure there's first class support for operating the system within that, that envelope. Um, and uh, we will see, uh, we have on our near term roadmap enabling integrations with weather system in particular, just to answer that directly. Um, um, maybe this is a question for you related to, to, to maintenance and operations. How often is there a need to inspect the dock drone itself since it is exposed to the elements 24 7, 365? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, the dock itself is an IP56 rated device. Um, and as we think about the dock and, you know, all the great R&D teams that work at Skydio, we, we expect um, the platforms to get more and ro more robust over time. I guess the way that I would answer this is the, the, the need to inspect the dock is actually relatively infrequent. You know, part of what we're uh, aiming for in our overall preventative maintenance cycles is is not to need to go out there to do anything with the dock more than once a year. Um, depending on the environment, that might be different, right? If you're in a sandy, humid place, that uh, might change based on maybe the ideal uh, situation. But um, just to get a little tactical here and, and, and be very upfront, I mean, part of what also is required in terms of maintenance is the drone itself. And so depending on your operational tempo, if you're flying every day for three hours a day, you'll probably wear through your props and need a new battery before you'll need to do anything with the dock. Um, if you're flying less than that, then maybe the dock will be the first thing that you need to maintain. Ultimately, this is all discovered as part of the solutions engineering process. Um, and this is something that we would work on with you as you think about that total cost of ownership, thinking about investing this, how often is someone going to have to go out there and do that? And whether or not, you know, you as an organization want to conduct that maintenance because you go out uh, to do other inspections that must be physical due to, you know, let's say a regulatory requirement, or um, you want somebody else to do it on behalf of you because that's easier for you. So a lot of this is, it depends, but we know that the ultimate goal is for organizations not to have to go out and, and touch this thing once a week, because that would defeat the purpose and, and ultimately eat into the savings and efficiency that you're looking for. Great. Um, maybe another one for, for you, Alden, uh, more of a like tactical question here. On the requirements for operators um, to have Part 107, do operators need to have Part 107 when audio operating doc, uh, drones from docks for routine inspection? Yeah, so, so right now the answer is yes. I think it starts to get a little bit um, interesting as we get further into the future and uh, and think about the different waivers that we want to do and what does it look like as you know, we, you know, like Christina mentioned, as we have engineers in, in uh, NOx or TOX or operation centers, you know, doing interesting things. So um, short answer is, is uh, yes, but long-term we, we think there's going to be some interesting things that, that uh, the, the, both the industry and the government probably will, will start to figure out. Um, great. And then, Corey, Christian, I think there's an interesting one here just in terms of like how companies are thinking about putting these skill sets up. Um, do companies seem to be contracting these tasks or training people in-house? Um, maybe, uh, Christina, maybe you can start. 
uh, with this question? Yeah, I think, again, I think it depends. However, I know for uh, NIPA as a public utility, it was actually very important to us to build the drone program and uh, think of the drones as a tool to put in the operator's hands in order to enable them to do their jobs better. So I think that whenever you do any sort of change management with technology, one of the uh, visceral responses that tends to come up is, oh, is the technology gonna come along and take my job? Is it, is it going to do my job for me and put me out of, put me out of work? So I think uh, one of the ways we wanted to reassure people is to say, hey, we have more work than we have people to do. Uh, this is a tool that will enable you to do your job uh, more efficiently and more safely um, and, and more conveniently uh, because some of this, especially with dock and remote ops, can be done indoors during a blizzard. Um, so I think there is tremendous value of uh, making the investment to train personnel in-house. Great. Uh, Corey, I just check in. Do you have anything to add to that perspective from your experience? Uh, no, I, I agree. Um, I think there's a lot of value in having your SME, um, whether it's land management, nuclear, whether it's, uh, you know, um, line or substation. I think having those people trained to to operate the aircraft, um, you know, as part of their job is is super important. Um, and, and I think the the collision avoidance and the ease of use with the uh, with the Skydia system makes that training um, not so you know, difficult. It's pretty easy to train folks to operate our aircraft. Great. Um, next one's a bit of a, of a use case question. We didn't really cover this, uh, but I think it is relevant um, for this crowd. Um, so is, is are we building out uh, the dock to um, handle uh, large scale solar sites um, and solar inspection? Um, so um, Alden, you want to you take a first pass at this? Uh, yeah, I mean, short answer is yes, and and here's sort of what it looks like. Um, integrating the 2D scan technology that we have today in our in our manually flown, or sorry, in our in our current Skydio uh, fleet, and putting that onto the dock is is a top priority for us from a roadmap perspective. And then secondly, one of the beautiful things about dock is the automated nature of data upload, ingestion, and then pushed through APIs to lots of different things. So whether you're using Raptor Maps or something like that to go process your data. It's something that we're we're certainly interested in, and and we are working with customers today who who are going through that same level of experimentation to make sure that the system can deliver the data that they want. But yeah, reach out to your Scotty yeah. rep. We'd we'd love to talk to you. Yeah, and maybe to be concrete here, like you know, we are um, all mentioned the two D um, scan. So some of the technologies the tech, uh, that we are uh, that we have on um, you know our, our non doc drone uh, capabilities like three D scan, two D scan. Um, we're actively moving into kind of that autonomous capability for docks. Um, solar, uh, solar farm inspection is one of the use cases that's like really informing um, how we think about that. 2D scan is gonna be the first capability that we are coming out with um, very soon and um, more to come on our near term with that. I think that's a good place to uh, wind things down, uh, talking about the future here. Uh, so I just first wanna thank the audience again for, for tuning in. Um, and thank our panelists here, our experts. I know they could continue discussing this at length all day long if we let them. Um, so sorry to cut this short, but if you're interested in learning more about DOC or our uh, early access program, please visit skydio.com slash DOC. Uh, you can get in touch with us through our webpage there. Uh, there's also a link pinned in the chat where you can go directly to the early access partner form. Uh, and I do wanna remind everyone this talk was recorded so if you missed any of it or if there were some technical issues, we're going to email that out. It'll also be available on demand on our Airborne Insights platform by end of day. Uh, and if we didn't get to your question today, we'll reach out directly uh, to make sure that gets answered for you. So thanks again for joining and thank you to the panelists and uh, see you all soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you all.